a reset button to propel Emmanuel Macron to re-election in 2022, or has it just gotten a little bit lonelier at the top in France? Hello, everyone. I'm François Picard. Welcome to the France 24 debate. The French president plucking out of obscurity center-right technocrat Jean Castex to be the new prime minister. A similar profile to his predecessor, Edouard Philippe. Why the new face? Why did the popular Philippe have to go after rave reviews for his management of the COVID crisis? Castex, the 55-year-old mayor of a small mountain town near the Spanish border, had most recently been Macron's lockdown coordinator. With the worst of the recession still ahead here and elsewhere in Europe, he takes over as France braces itself for a new phase of the crisis. Make no mistake, this reshuffle to a large degree is all about Macron, who surged to victory in 2017 as an outsider who had never before run for office, but whose party failed to grow roots at the local level in recent uh, municipal elections. Is he a one-man band? Will his promise of a Jupiterian presidency, as he put it, come back to haunt him? The French president seems more than ever to be concentrating most powers in his hands. Surveys consistently show that voters here want a strong leader, but they also know who to blame when things go wrong. Can Macron deliver on his promise made last week of a new roadmap for the final 21 months of his presidency? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at France's big government reshuffle and joining us, Member of Parliament from Emmanuel Macron's La République En Marche party, Natalia Puzirev, thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, François. We also want to welcome uh, Philippe Moreau-Chevrolet, columnist and political consultant, founder of MCBG Consulting. How are you, sir? Good evening, François. Fine, thank you. Also in the French capital, Mathieu Nyong'o, a philosopher and the, the founder of Anou la démocratie. In a word, what is Anou la démocratie? To, uh, what do you say, how would you translate? Power to the people? Something like that? Yeah, we could say power to the people. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a citizen movement who, who wants more democracy in a political world. All and right. we have some elected people for these elections. Oh, maybe we'll talk about that in a moment yeah. as well. Andrew Smith, senior lecturer in uh, uh, contemporary history and politics at the University of Chichester. Welcome to the show. Glad you're with us. Thank you. Because, as you perhaps have noticed, the uh, opinion of Emmanuel Macron uh, when you're abroad is not the same as when you're here in France. I'm sure you've picked up on that contrast. Yeah, just a little. Um, it's really interesting to see those contrasts. And I think it's um, it's always useful to get that kind of perspective as well, to look at the different ways in which that, uh, that discussion happens in different political contexts. All right, we'll talk more about it in a minute. But first, let's go over what's happened uh, since Friday. It all went well, really very fast. It was supposed to be a cabinet meeting. It was scrapped. Instead, the prime minister tendering his resignation. Shirley Sitbaum has more. Critics of President Emmanuel Macron could argue he has replaced Prime Minister Edouard Philippe with a largely unknown technocrat because Philippe had become too popular when Macron's own approval ratings have shrunk. Others say a new prime minister was needed to carry out a new series of difficult reforms. Last week's local vote and the election of several environmentalists show the French want change. Certainement plus d'écologie, ça c'est sûr. Bon, bah, la santé, l'économie mondiale, euh, parce qu'il y aura de l'impact sur l'économie française, évidemment. Prise en compte euh, certainement euh, un peu plus de la précarité quand même, de la fracture sociale. Macron has passed several major reforms in his first three years in office, but he has also faced protests against them. The COVID-19 crisis has hit the economy, plunging the country into its worst recession since World War II. Millions could lose their jobs. The French president says he intends to open the political process, organize more referendums, consult with the population. The new prime minister is an experienced technocrat known for resolving difficult disputes. Un profit d'une personnalité qui n'a pas d'équation politique propre. Ça traduit aussi, bien sûr, le choix d'Emmanuel Macron de reprendre la main et sans doute d'incarner encore plus le pouvoir, ce que pendant la crise on avait moins vu. Jean Castex's goal. 
pushing through Macron's new reforms, which will prove useful when the president runs for re-election in two years' time. Why this government reshuffle? Well, first of all, I would say it's um, a normal behavior, you know, to change government in the course of a mandate of a quinquennat. Uh, so there's nothing uh, very bizarre in that. Um, it came to a point clearly where we need to have a new impulse, especially we feel the urge to uh, restart the economy. Um, and I think that uh, for that, you need to have a new team. Um, uh, and yet, uh, again, that the prime minister leaves on a on a high. Edouard Philippe, uh, who'd done well, and, and we're still wondering: was he sacked or did he quit? Oh, I think it's um, it's a shared decision between the president and the prime minister. I think they came to an agreement that um, something had to a new signal had to be given to the population. And in order to uh, uh, embody this change, you need to have a new team. And it doesn't uh, diminish at all the, uh, uh, the excellent action that the prime minister had. Philippe Moreau-Chevrolet, uh, is this a renewal? Is this something different? It tries to be. Uh, it has to be in a way, because the, there is no other justification for this change, apart from the fact that Macron wants it. So it needs to be different in order to demonstrate by itself uh, that it has a meaning. The, the, the main question is not that he would want to reshuffle a cabinet, Macron, but the question is why. And uh, so far we don't know why, because the prime minister was quite um, efficient and uh, was quite liked and uh, quite comforting for the French population, which is under duress uh, from the uh, sanitary crisis, obviously, and the, also the economic crisis. Um, and uh, it seemed that the government had found its way in, uh, in, in a way, uh, apart from uh, various issues that he uh, that he had, but that could be treated differently. We could have had a reshuffle that would have only uh, casted away ministers that were really problematic, such as the Castaner for the Home Office, or maybe Sibet Ndiaye for the uh, you know. Uh, she's the spokesperson for the government, and she's very, very uh, much attacked for what she does. So we could have thought that he would have changed only the problematic ones, but he decided to reshuffle the whole government. We don't know, know exactly why, so everyone is interpreting, uh, everyone is putting a sense in it. That yeah, uh, well, just, just, for, just to remind our viewers, uh, this is a pre-record, so you probably know by now who's in the cabinet, full disclosure here. Philippe, I was struck by something in that report. You heard that pollster say, uh, this is Emmanuel Macron's uh, will to uh, reinforce the position of the executive branch of government. Now, France is already unique in Europe in that it has this, these outsized power for the executive branch of government. Why would the president want more? Uh, I don't know, really, because the uh, executive branch is already, as you said, all-powerful. I mean, the parliament is merely uh, a structure that would uh, register the executive uh, branch decisions. So it's not like that there is no really, no really any political debate anymore in the sense that uh, there is majority and the majority votes for what the government wants to put in place. So uh, I think it's more about uh, an image issue. I mean, the, I think... The president wants to be the one that appears to be working and to be uh, to, that appears to be the center of everything. And I think with Edouard Philippe, the former prime minister, he didn't have the uh, possibility to be the center of attention because the prime minister was really the one uh, capitalizing on, on the popularity. Uh, it was really the one that the French people liked. So I think it's a very it's a classical situation under the Fifth Republic in France. Uh, the president doesn't like his prime minister to be too popular. If the prime minister gets too popular, then we, he behaves the prime minister. <laughs> and of course, the flip side of that, uh, Mathieu Nyong'o, is that, uh, well, we know with those tough negotiations that are going to happen that uh, uh, all roads lead to one place, the presidential palace, and that there's really not much point negotiating with anybody else. Yeah, I... 
I think what I think uh, about when I uh, I see what uh, what is, uh, is is taking place is uh, you know the quotation from the um, uh, Italian writer uh, Giuseppe di Lampedusa everything must change so that everything can stay the same. Uh, I mean we had these elections these municipal elections we were which were a catastrophe for LROM a catastrophe. And uh, we saw that in the, um, the, the, the movie you made, is that people in France, they want three things, actually. They want justice, social justice, they want ecology, and also they want democracy. Because if you look at precisely um, um, to the result of the elections, you can see that um, the city which have been um, uh, won by um, the ecologists were city in which there were there were very interesting democratic processes uh, in which uh, they wanted to build uh, public policies in another way they, they made this promise promise that okay we will decide with you and they construct the programs in a very collective way and they chose the candidates in a very collective way in uh, cities such as Poitiers uh, such as Besançon such as Tours and so on and so forth. And now, what is the answer uh, to these aspirations? Again, social justice, ecology, democracy. The answer is Macron saying, I will do exactly the same. I chose one of my holograms, okay? Because uh, Jean Castex, I don't know him, nobody knows him. But when you see the profile of uh, this, this man, again, I don't know him, you have the impression that he's an hologram of Edouard Philippe, who was an hologram hologram of uh, Mr. Macron. So the answer to this aspiration is verticality, is Jupiter. And I think it's a very bad answer. Uh, you, you, let, let me argue the point with you for a sec, Mathieu. You say that uh, it, it's, a, it's a resounding defeat for Emmanuel Macron's party. It's a brand new party, right? Uh, who's in, uh, init Initially, it was called En Marche, and its initials EM are the same as Emmanuel Macron, uh, is the argument that, well, we now live in a world where some movements are better suited for a presidential poll and others are better suited for a local election. Well, I won't say that. I would say that, you know, uh, at the beginning of the story of Emmanuel Macron, there were many people who thought that he would do something else uh, also with the collective construction of the program and the decisions, uh, he, would, he was saying that I, 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 we need for horizontality. We need for the end of uh, someone decided, decided, deciding alone of everything. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. And it's a big failure. And, you know, people uh, uh, during the election, uh, they said, OK, it's a failure. You, you made something really wrong. Uh, even in, in a city like Paris, which uh, um, vote, voted a lot for Emmanuel Macron. It was a big failure, a big route. So I don't think there is a contradiction between what you can do nationally and what you do um, locally. It's just that Emmanuel Macron came with this promise, I will change the way of doing policy, and it just failed. Andrew Smith, what do you make of this reshuffle? I think it's really interesting in terms of the way that we uh, that we understand the Fifth Republic. Of course, you've mentioned already ideas of uh, you know um, Macron's Jupiterian image, the idea of the kind of the providential leader um, of the Fifth Republic, and that's been that way you know right since uh, De Gaulle designed it as its architect, talking about the idea that power comes from the people and is vested in the president. This is an interesting moment, I think, because, as you say, it throws up all those tensions that we've seen throughout the Fifth Republic between uh, presidents and their prime ministers. There's some interesting moments here in terms of, you know, this is Macron's second prime minister. We could look at uh, de Gaulle's um, second prime minister, Pompidou. We could look at uh, Giscard d'Estaing's uh, second prime minister, in, uh, in Raymond Barr as well, and see the way that actually many of these guys tend to be that sort of uh, slightly, I don't know, less exciting technocratic figure. So I think you're right, this definitely does, you know, I would agree with Mathieu, this does seem like someone who's been put in place to, to do a job, as it were, not to kind of wrestle with power or, you know, think about a kind of charismatic relaunch. This is someone there to take care of some specific tasks, while the hyper president kind of run, uh, runs the, 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 runs the whole show from above. And so I think, you know, if anything, this is very much a sort of idea of a, of a relaunch, but very much a personalized relaunch, essentially uh, making very little change so that bigger changes can be seen in that kind of, you know, image uh, that we heard about before.
Natalia Puzirev, you're a first-time member of parliament elected in the wave that followed Emmanuel Macron's election in 2017. Uh, it, do you feel it, that, that hyper-presidency, when you have caucuses of uh, La République En Marche, your political party, that uh, it really is a club uh, all revolving around one person? I think this is definitely part of the Fifth Republic, as uh, was previously said. And this is something um, we cannot deny. When um, we came to the uh, uh, Parliament, we could really experience um, not the world of the system, but how vertical it is. So uh, even if I don't uh, share the comments that were um, done by uh, Mr. Mathieu uh, Nyong'o, I, I think that um, because I, we are a new party and we have aspiration to be to open more to uh, you know to the, to have an, a more open democracy to the people. This is a strong aspiration of our march. And then yes, comes the reality: the system, the Fifth Republic, is what it is, and it's more vertical. And I think that we had this ambition to change the constitution, maybe put proportional uh, representation may, uh, by, by opening um, or facilitating, easing referendums and everything. So we have really the ambition. This um, reform was pushed back, but I, I think this is really one of the key issues for a second man mandate by uh, President Macron, and in 2022, the question, or during the campaign, so not in such a long time, the uh, debate will be open again. How do we want uh, to have an effective democracy that is in touch with the people and um, which is managing uh, some issues like, you know, we don't have such kind of bipartism as it is the case in the US or in England, in Great Britain. We uh, have uh, less the culture of consensus as in Germany. So we had to find yeah, there's out- the, There's the old adage that the French prefer uh, revolution to reform. Uh, I don't know if that still holds true today, Natalia Puzirev, but can you explain to us why it seems like Emmanuel Macron is more popular abroad than he is at home? Well, it's a cultural aspect. The French people are rather pessimistic or skeptical about everything. They are always self-criticizing. Uh, so I, I think this maybe, um, how to say, we need to, to build trust, more trust for sure. Trust is the main word. And I think Emmanuel Macron always um, acknowledged that that we have to build more trust within the, 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 the country, the nation. That's why, for instance, he, he launched this uh, uh, Convention Citoyenne, uh, Convention for Citizens around environmental issues. It's a way not to diminish the uh, traditional representative democracy, but it's the way to show the French people that everyone can have a good say. Yeah, we've had a lot of these talk shops, and I know Philippe Montchevrolet, you and I have talked about it before. His answer, part of his answer to the Yellow Vest movement was to organize what was called the Grand Debate. Uh, it, now you have a different one here that Natalia Puzirev just mentioned uh, for the environment. The, the, uh, there's, a, there's a big discussion that's going on around uh, a reform of health care. Uh, the new prime minister has promised to give answers to on, the, on that speedily. Uh, but... Is that part of changing the system or is this just kind of ad hoc placating public opinion, these 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 big talk shops? It's between the two. Uh, I think the intentions at the very beginning uh, of the mandate were uh, of uh, reshuffling of the uh, French democracy with huge ambitions. The title of uh, uh, one of uh, Macron's books, uh, ironically, was Revolution. That was the title. Uh, so it was very French in a way, and I think the intentions were very good at the beginning of the mandate. But then, um, since the movement didn't manage to get roots uh, in France, I mean, it's not rooted in the French uh, political landscape, as we saw during the last elections, 
And uh, since the uh, Macron's popularity quite fell down and uh, the crisis ha happened, I think the ambitions, had to be ambitions, initial ambitions had to be revised and to play it down. So I think uh, it, it's not the time to obviously have a referendum. It's not the time to reshuffle the democracy and we are only handling with a very, very deep and uh, concerning crisis. So I hope, my hope is that the new government will have more strength, more legitimacy, less uh, trouble than the previous one to deal with this crisis. And uh, if it does that, then it, it will manage to um, appear legitimate and uh, we will forget every, everything about Edouard Philippe, the former prime minister, and we will uh, just uh, maybe uh, deal and cope with the situation better. We yeah, all, all a lot on the plate of the new prime minister when we look ahead to, again, 21 months left before the next presidential election. Uh, here's what Camille Nedelec had to say in this report about the challenges facing Jean Castex, that new prime minister. Just a day after being named France's new prime minister, Jean Castex was at this electronics factory near Paris. He's hoping manufacturing will be a motor for economic growth. J'ai vraiment voulu, je vous le dis à tous, venir faire ma première visite, une entreprise, innovation, l'industrie, la crise, la, diffi la difficulté, hein? la difficulté, on voit bien. The government will help industries to get back on their feet with a recovery plan set to kick off in September. As France recovers from the pandemic, its economy is reeling and is set to contract 10% this year. Saving French manufacturing is a priority. But he's got another thorny issue to contend with as well, pension reform, which French President Emmanuel Macron has put back on the agenda. We won't abandon pension reform. I'm open to making changes to it. Unions say now isn't the right time, and so do many employers. Là, il faut appuyer sur pause euh, pendant quelques mois pour qu'on mette toute notre énergie derrière ce qui compte, c'est-à-dire le sauvegarde de l'outil. Parce que c'est ça qui compte, notre énergie collective de partenaires sociaux. Effectivement, c'est là-dessus qu'il faut qu'elle se concentre. Another portfolio he'll have to handle is the environment. After municipal elections saw a wave of votes go to green candidates. The rollout of new environmental measures are set to come under the spotlight, as French people demand a strong economy without sacrificing sustainability. Of course, Mathieu Nyong'o, we have no idea how bad the upcoming recession is going to be. Uh, if you were whispering into Jean Castex's ear, where would you put your energy? Well, I used to whisper uh, you know, to hear of uh, some ministers uh, during France for a long time. And again, all, all the thing, I was always saying the same thing. Let's try to see and to hear people and to know what they really want. Uh, I'm not as optimistic as Mr. Uh, Moreau when he says that uh, we will see if he's competent and if he's able to manage with, uh, to deal with the problems we are facing right now. I mean, one man can't deal with the problem of 67 million people. All right, let, me, let me ask you about that. Let me ask you about that because one of the yeah. big questions uh, uh, yeah. regarding Emmanuel Macron is that he's labeled as a little out of touch, too much of a technocrat, gone yeah. to all the right schools. Here you have this new prime minister who went to the same uh, school of public administration, Lena. Uh, who knows the ins and outs of all the ministries, of all the high, high civil service. At the same time, he's mayor of a local town in the Pyrenees. For those who speak French, you heard his southern accent there in that report. And he claims to know all 6,000 of his constituents personally and sees all of them on a personal basis. So which one is he, Jean Castex? In touch or out of touch? Yeah, I think it's not the problem. It's, it, it looks like Emmanuel Macron. And the problem is, is, is about centralization, you know. Uh, you talked about, uh, I, I was happy that uh, um, you talked about the, the convention, the, the climate convention with citizens, because a lot of French people, they like this kind of process again. You have 80% of people, of French people, who want 
the decisions of the, the convention to be submitted to a referendum. That's the new deal. We construct, we build the, the, the future together. Look at what happened in Portugal, for instance. It was because of the attitude of the prime minister that the crisis has been dealt in, in quite a good way. Look at what happened in, in, in Germany. In Germany, we have, they have this uh, tradition of discussion uh, about uh, the way they will deal with the economic crisis. In France, we see, we feel that there will be a kind of authoritarian uh, will to deal with these problems. And it's not the good way. That's what I will say to have, this prime minister. If you have more of these referendums, more of these uh, citizens' conventions or popular votes, as you call them, are you not further undermining the power of people like Natalia Puzirev here present, who's a member of parliament? Shouldn't it be parliament that makes the laws? I think that they have a, a, um, a, a true uh, power is to organize this kind of debate, is to uh, make people think the right things, well, uh, uh, to, to ask the good questions. And I will give you um, just an example, is what happens in Tours. I really accompany what did Emmanuel Denis during this, the last three years before to become the mayor of Tours. And he was always consulting. And by consulting, he made a very clear idea about what was the needs in Tours. And that's why actually he won the election. I'm sure he would be a very good mayor. I think the, the, the new posture of the, ele um, the, um, the elected is to be uh, the, the organizer of the, deep, the public debate. And then you can decide, of course, but you have to decide with people. And to let some, some, uh, some on, on some topics, you have to let people decide for themselves. Andrew Smith, your thoughts on which way French democracy is headed? <laughs> Big question. Um, I think it's a um, it's a really interesting thing. Um, as you say, there's this kind of you know, we look at um, precedents in the Fifth Republic. We can look at precedents um, from before and the, the fourth and the third as well. At the moment, I think uh, Macron and his party and his ideology looks much more like a kind of Third Republic radical. You know, campaigning left and then governing right. I think unless there's a big movement in terms of uh, kind of uh, policy direction, then that that dissatisfaction will continue. Um, I've written a bit about um, some of the disturbances um, at the end of last year and the start of this year, the Gilets Jaunes protests, and about the ways in which uh, that actually, I think that represented a kind of popular dissatisfaction, a sense of a disconnect at, at play. I think that's echoed in the municipal as well. We saw this idea of what, you know, nearly 60% abstention rate. Now, of course, people are afraid to go out, the virus crisis and all the rest of it, but actually that is, I think, a really important consideration. Um, People are, do not feel as if they're being consulted. And I agree to an extent with Mathieu as well. I think there are ideas of citizen conventions are really important. I mentioned before De Gaulle's uh, quote where he said that, you know, the argument are, that Aren't you downplaying, oh. Andrew, though, COVID-19? Because municipal elections are typically the election people do go to vote in France uh, in. Yeah. And uh, it, it seemed to, when I was watching election night coverage that mm -hmm. everybody, it, it's kind of like COVID was on pause for a night. We were just yeah. talking electoral <laughs> politics. But... Wasn't there a big COVID factor in those municipal elections? I think there was. I think there was. Um, but actually, you know, that's that's important because we've just had a historic interruption of travel, of custom, of commerce. All of these regular systems have been broken. We've seen what it means to live in a slightly different way. We've grown our attachment um, to our kind of immediate surroundings um, on both sides of the channel. I think it's really interesting when you look at, you know, we talked about the Gilets Jaunes protests and much of that was about localism. It was about people reforging those connections between popular politics and the assembly. And I think what we're seeing here is perhaps another step in that kind of negotiation of popular politics and the assembly. So actually, I agree with Mathieu in a way, there is this kind of like negotiation that needs to take place. I think COVID is important because I think it's actually changed the way we all interact with it. Whatever policy agenda Macron had, you know, 16 months ago or whatever, is now going to be thrown out the bath, as it were, because this is a, a new reality. Of course, we now have to adapt to kind of shifts in terms of international trade. We have to look again at ideas of mobility. Those ideas of openness are being questioned every single day. And actually, I think that's a, a really potent moment in which to think about the convictions of politics and what the actual point of that is. I think that reasserts the importance of the local um, in the political in this kind of political moment. Mm -hmm. I think that is what needs to be captured. So actually, I think what Matthew's talking about, these ideas of assemblies, these ideas of kind of more dialogue, is an absolutely crucial element that Macron has hinted at in his nouveau schema. He talked about decentralizing to the mayors, he talked about all these things. We've heard about Grand Debat. 
And this, I think, is going to be one of the crucial things. How do we manage the idea of the kind of the placeman, as it were, the you know the PM that allows Macron to be PM himself, um, and this at the same time imperative, I think, to listen to the French people. Can you listen when you're at the Elysee Palace, Natalia Puzirov? Sorry, I didn't get that. Can you? Can you? Can you? Is it possible to listen when you're? Uh, behind the gates of the, the French presidential mm. palace. Yes, but uh, I, would, I, I would like to come back on the, the, the fact exactly why we are changing the government is uh, linked to this uh, localism, as it was uh, said, the need to reinforce, and cl to clarify first, and to reinforce the uh, responsibilities at, at the local level so that everyone can be um, acting uh, and it will be even the more necessary because we are facing um, a difficult period in front of in front of us. So um, that's why we had to change the team as well. It's a new page that is opening, and it's um, empowering more the uh, uh, the local uh, leaders and the people as well, everyone has to feel that he's responsible and in, char in charge of um, acting uh, during this, uh, this new um, phase that is, as I say, very, uh, very difficult. Again, just to explain to our international audience, uh, it, what we saw in those municipal elections was a lot of, as always in France, a lot of outgoing mayors re-elected, but also some reversals, and most notably, a green wave sweeping through the major cities. Uh, elections play out locally, first at the ballot box, and then you have the meetings of the uh, municipal council to actually vote for the mayor in those big cities. Marseille voted on Saturday, and uh, for the first time in more than a quarter century, the mayor no longer hails from the right. Instead, it's a lifelong militant of the Green Party who's become the new mayor. J'ai pleuré, j'ai pleuré d'émotions, beaucoup d'émotions. Et un grand merci pour l'ensemble des Marseillaises et des Marseillais qui nous ont portés là. Et l'ensemble du Perrantan qui nous a permis de faire donner cet espoir à l'ensemble des Marseillais. And here's the interesting bit, Philippe Moreau Chevrolet. Uh, you look at the, uh, at, at the results. Uh, it's what? Bordeaux, uh, Lyon, Marseille, uh, major cities that have uh, Rouen, uh, that, have gone, that have gone to the Greens. Except when you look more in detail, you see it's not the Greens, it's the Greens in a coalition. And uh, it's coalition politics that have worked at the local level, it seems. So again, judging by history, how does that work in France? Will those mayors be effective? Yes, they will. Uh, the, it, what we saw is that the uh, electorate that had voted for En Marche uh, in 2017 in the big cities they shifted from uh, En Marche, from Macron to the new green left coalitions. And uh, I think it will be effective because they have a huge, huge popular support and they, they embody something new. Uh, but the, major, the majority of the cities and the, um, the, the, the wall of the country is not on the left or, uh, or green, it's more conservative. So if you want to understand what Macron is doing, you have to look at the big numbers and the big numbers show that the right is really powerful in France still outside of the main major cities. And uh, that's why we have a prime minister, which is very much on the right. And maybe we will have some concessions in the casting, governmental casting for the left of the uh, environment. Yeah, they, they said that, you know, with, with the lockdown period, Philippe, that uh, uh, digital inequality was set to grow. Uh, all, all, all inequalities were set to grow. What you're saying effectively is that the France of uh, uh, the hipsters who, uh, who want bike sharing and the France of the uh, people who marched in the Yellow Vest movement is going, that gap is going to widen? Oh, yes, it's very, it's, it has never been so wide. I mean, it's really, it's really politically uh, strong. I mean, it's, uh, and the, the, confine, the containment, the lockdown has increased that monumentally. So uh, to give you an example, what, the, what is perceived as a, uh, an, an environmental policy, a typical environmental policy outside of the big cities is the question of, should I drive a car? 
in the big cities, people will tell you, no, I, I will use my bike, uh, if possible, an electrical bike. Uh, it's cool and uh, I, it's ecologically, environmentally uh, uh, good, so I will, I will use it. But outside of that big cities, uh, you can't use a bike to do to perform like uh, a transportation of 30 kilometers, for instance, if you need to go to work, you, you will need to use your car. So if you put, uh, see if you put the taxation, a new tax, a new uh, uh, burden on the drivers, they will, uh, they will go into a fight. That's exactly the beginning of the Yellow Vest movement. So this divide you're referring to was at the very core of the Yellow Vest movement. So it's not an accident, it's really a structural thing. And uh, we, we can only hope for the government or the president or the candidates that will be able to reconcile the two, if it's possible. If it's possible, again, uh, let me put this to you, Mathieu Nyong'o, uh, in tw you, you said in the 21 months that are left uh, of the Macron presidency, that's not possible. You don't see him changing course in any way. You don't see a more inclusive French presidency. So then what's going to happen in 2022? Could we find ourselves with a second round of the presidential election where it could be a far left candidate against a far right candidate? No, I think I think that the, uh, uh, an alternative can be constructed. On these three pillars, uh, I, I say again, uh, social justice, ecology, and above all, I would say democracy. Make people talk together. That's how a coalition can be can be made. We talked about Marseille. That's the way the, she did that. She comes from citizen movements, actually, uh, alternative movements. Michel Rubilia. So this is the way things can be done, that the construction of an alternative which takes care about um, um, people on these three pillars, economy, um, justice, social justice, ecology and democracy. So it is possible. But then again, Andrew Smith, when you look at uh, the little time that's left in Emmanuel Macron's mandate, uh, which way will it go? Does he have the capability of, um, again, drawing more people to him. You, you mentioned the Third Republic. In those days, it was a parliamentary system before the Second World War, and uh, you were always building coalitions. Can he still build a coalition? I think we are absolutely moving back into to an era of electoral coalitions, which uh, are going to have an increasing influence. And I say that largely in the wake of um, what the uh, the weakness of the Parti Socialiste, the, the weakness of Les Républicains in the face of their more extreme wings. I think the Parti Socialiste has obviously seen in this last election that it really needs to kind of cleave to the um, to the to the Greens if it wants to actually drive itself forward. Um, I think that's really really important. Personally, I still think come twenty twenty two. We'll probably see a sort of repeat second round runoff of what we saw this time. I think Macron's very intelligently um, put a prime minister in place that um, has strong links to his, one of his, you know, his uh, competitors on the centre right, and Xavier Bertrand. Of course, uh, Castex worked with him in, in the health ministry. I think we're still looking at these uh, phenomena you've described already, this age of commuter democracy, as uh, Jean Villar calls it, I think, very intelligently. We've got this difference between the people that live in the suburbs and the uh, and, and the wider countryside and those that live in the centre of the cities. I think forging that kind of um, divide, managing to actually join those people together in one project is something that's very, very difficult. It relies on playing on a kind of um, a natural kind of conservative reaction, a sort of uh, a desire to move away from dirigism and kind of great projects and of state and all the rest of it and open up a greater kind of um, listening ear to the public. So I think, you know, with this appointment with Castex, what Macron could possibly do is take some more personal charge in terms of some of these sort of environmental policies to make them more attractive. Attractive. We heard already, um, Philippe mentioned the idea of the um, you know, the green taxes and the yellow vest. I think that's really problematic if you actually sh jump straight back to those same reforms. Um, the project is for Macron to show movement, to show acknowledgement of this new trend and to claim back some of those who feel that their voice isn't being heard because that's who ends up voting for the Rassemblement National. That's who ends up voting for parties that say, you look, you know, it's not worth engaging in the process. So it's about faith in the process. We mentioned right at the start the idea of trust, and I think that is absolutely crucial in the second uh, second phase, the second uh, second roadmap, as it were. And that's how I pose We're running short on time. Just very briefly, uh, the uh, how do you run as an incumbent after running as an insurgent? Hmm. Uh, um, well, 
Let me just conclude on the fact that I, I'm looking really forward to uh, renovation, uh, refundation of our democratic system as well. But we need to give time because you see, whenever there's a crisis, all the French people look at the state to uh, to, to provide solution. So it's it has really to be. Uh, the whole nation has to be moving towards a kind of a more mature democratic system. Philippe Rochevalet, the last time you came on the show, it was during lockdown. And uh, you saw the future as, watch out, there could be a mystery candidate that comes out of nowhere that's going to be a populist. And there could be a very different kind of French president in 2022. Now that lockdown's over, that the cafes have reopened, that it's summertime, do you still hold that thought? Uh, yes. The, the fact is, people don't want... The, what we see in the polls in the, is that people don't want to have the uh, uh, frontal opposition between Le Pen and Macron in 2020-2020. They don't want to see that happening. They, they, they don't want that casting. And what we saw in earlier, in all the, the previous elections, presidential elections, is that the casting that we had in mind two years before, it never went uh, uh, in reality. It never happened in reality. So we know for sure that the French population will decide, will act in a way that will uh, prevent that from happening. So there should be a third candidate. Uh, we don't know if it will be detrimental to Macron or Le Pen, but there should be a third one. And we don't see uh, a candidate appearing from the usual crowd of the usual French politicians. So it could be an outsider. But it won't happen the way we think it will happen now. It's impossible. The French are not like that. Expect the unexpected. We'll, uh, we'll be watching out for that. Philippe Morochevrolet, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank uh, as well Mathieu Nyongo, Andrew thank Smith, you. Natalia Puzirev. And we want to thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate. There's much more on our website, france24.com, as well as Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Bye for now. Fake news, noun. False stories that appear to be news spread on the internet or using other media. At France 24, our job is to provide you with information that's been verified. We check sources, we check facts, we sort what is true from what is fake. At the France 24 observers, we verify photos and videos circulating online. If they're fake, we let you know and tell you how we spotted them. In fact or fake, we dig into viral stories around Europe to shake out the truth from the trash. Every day, the InfoMigrants team scours social networks to fight fake news about the reality of migration. France 24, news based on facts. Liberté, égalité, actualité.